Thank you, Cole. Well, um, I imagine everyone here has been following what's happening in Gaza. It, it's uh, becomes more and more indescribable. On top of the general genocide in Gaza, there's a literally a Holocaust going on in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, where Israel seems to be intent on um, carrying out its plan to depopulate uh, the northern part of Gaza and possibly reintroduce uh, Jewish settlements there. Um, uh, Anthony Blinken is in uh, is in the Middle East. He was in Israel yesterday and uh, at a press conference in which he was asked about the general's plan that we uh, mentioned last week, which is the idea of uh, basically depopulating northern Gaza and killing anybody who remains. Uh, Blinken said the Israeli government uh, claims it's not their policy, and he claims to believe it. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, that actual policy is being carried out on the ground. And uh, you can either believe what uh, Blinken and Netanyahu say or believe your own eyes as you uh, look on what's happening in Gaza. Uh, in, uh, in Lebanon, the uh, Israeli assault continues and is widening. Uh, there was heavy bombing on uh, Tyre, Sur, uh, in the southern part of coastal Lebanon. Uh, again, you know, a million or so refugees are struggling to find a place to stay outside of the bombed areas. And uh, Israeli troops have entered, you know, very, very slightly into Lebanon and are being resisted fiercely and are suffering casualties. Um, meanwhile, it seems that the U.S. policy and the Israeli policy is both to effectuate uh, some kind of regime change in Lebanon. And again, as I mentioned before, it's hard to have regime change when you don't have a regime in place. It literally would be to create a new uh, friendly to Israel regime, which seems to have very little support in Lebanon outside of the very far right Maronite community, the Lebanese forces that carried out the uh, Sabra Shatila massacres under Israeli uh, support in 1982. Um, so uh, what exactly the aims are other than destruction in Lebanon or the feasible aims uh, are, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, Blinken, again, shuttling, this is his 11th visit to the Middle East since last October 7th. And he seems to have in mind magically to call into existence a new political and military status quo in the Middle East. It reminds me when uh, Israel invaded Lebanon the last time in 2006, George Bush's Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, called it the birth pangs of a new Middle East. And that seems to be the fantasy of uh, U.S. policy for decades to somehow substitute their own version of the Middle East for the actual reality which exists on the ground. So Blinken is in Saudi Arabia now. Uh, what he's trying to do is not clear, but there certainly won't be official recognition of Israel uh, by Saudi Arabia uh, under the present circumstances. And in fact, they have nothing to gain from it. Their de facto relations with Israel supply them with military intelligence and hardware and they're happy with that while sort of remaining mum uh, on the official level. Uh, so, you know, that's really all, you know, we could go on and on in the details, but uh, that's all I can say now. Just <laughs> I thought given that we're in our deep within our presidential election period, there was a poll in Israel that uh, said Israelis prefer Trump to Harris 63% to 20%. And uh, I imagine in Netanyahu's base on the far right, it's even more lopsided. So as we wait for what happens with Israel's uh, expected attack against Iran, this may be the October surprise that will succeed if, if we need it anymore to succeed in getting Trump elected, which is Israel's sort of political aim in the United States. So that's all for now.
Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we got a question or comment from Dan. Okay. Hey, Jeff, just real quick. Um, there's a, there's, there's, um, there's a sort of, I don't know how to put it. There's a sort of diversification of their investment basket in the United States. There are real questions about whether or not they are um, uh, in contact with Iran about targeting in Israel. Uh, the Iranians and Saudis just announced they're going to have a joint uh, exercises. I, I really don't, I don't expect you, you understand. I don't know if anybody knows about it, but I, I find it super cynical if if this level of um uh hedging you know making sure that all the bases are covered for us no matter what happens going forward you know saudi arabia and iran does it mean that saudi arabia is pulling away from the united states or the united states is just covering all of its bases and slowly preparing to accept pulling away from this genocidal government it's just it's it's mind boggling all of the stuff that's going on by. And then uh, the U.S. envoy to Lebanon has been manipulating things and trying to get the new a change to 1701 to say that the UNIFIL will stay north of the Latani River. It's, it's there's so much. It's right. so much darkness going on. It's terrible. Well, uh, Israel has been regularly attacking the UNIFIL uh, yeah. outposts within southern Lebanon, and they clearly would like to force them away. So there are no international witnesses to the atrocities that they continue to commit in southern Lebanon. Uh, and you're right, Dan, I should have mentioned uh, the outline of uh, what the U.S. and Israel are proposing is more or less to allow a permanent Israeli presence in the southern part of Lebanon to enforce uh, keeping Hezbollah away from the border and also the free flying of Israeli jets and bombers over Lebanon with no complaint. And of course, uh, even, uh, you know, there's, there are very few people in Lebanon that are willing to accept this. And uh, and uh, the, the Israeli assault on Gaza and now Lebanon has uh, eased some of the political and sectarian uh, differences within Lebanon. Uh, so there had been previously a Saudi-supported Sunni movement that was anti-Hezbollah, but now uh, with Hezbollah standing up to defend Sunni Muslims in Gaza, uh, that's less pertinent. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, we can't expect moral behavior by states for the most part. Clearly the Saudis, as you said, are hedging their bets. They don't want to be uh, the next U.S. proxy war uh, and see their own country destroyed. So they're playing both sides of the street, obviously. Uh, but, but, uh, the idea that uh, that the U.S. can somehow establish a new hegemony based on uh, the region recognizing Israel seems unlikely to me in any short term. And you're right, uh, the Saudis are also talking to the Iranians, and uh, they don't seem interested at all in joining a U.S.-Israeli war against Iran. And of course, part of the October surprise uh, potential is that there are now 100 U.S. missile troops in Israel, based in Israel, and should there be a heavy exchange of uh, of uh, missiles back and forth, that uh, battery with 100 U.S. service people is potentially a target. And what that would mean, I mean, a legitimate target, certainly, and what that would mean in terms of U.S. response and U.S. politics is hard to fathom in the next two weeks. So, uh you know, hold on to your seats is all we can say. And uh, hopefully we'll get through uh, this period without World War Three. Thanks, Jeff. OK, great. Zarina? Uh, yes. Uh, right now, the BRICS meetings happening with Russia, um, Iran and Saudi Arabia are there. I was wondering if there's anything that you heard along that for uh, for all this that's going on. And Turkey. Uh, which is a new thing. Uh, Turkey, is, which is a NATO member. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, there are a lot of countries in the world that don't want to be under a sort of unilateral U.S. dominated system. And, you know, BRICS is a way of them also hedging their bets and having an alternative sort of financial system that uh, is immune from U.S. sanctions. And of course, BRICS, 
uh, what does it stand for? Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, China South Africa, South Africa. South right. Africa. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's expanding. We've got twelve <laughs> members now, not just five. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it's all worth watching. I don't think you know it's going to materially change anything in the Middle East soon, but in the long run, you know anything that moves away from unilateral U.S. Uh, dominance is probably good for the world, uh, certainly good for the Middle East. So uh, we'll have to see where that goes. And, uh, and of course, all of this is tied in uh, with the U.S. Uh, war, uh, proxy war in Ukraine and potentially elsewhere. So um, we're entering a very uh, yeah. unstable period. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I should say, uh, just on a personal note, uh, I've been all over the area in southern Lebanon where the Israelis are bombing now and know those uh, towns and villages very well and have a close friend who uh, in 2022 uh, took me and another friend of mine around visiting those areas in, near the border. And he, uh, the last we heard from him was uh, two weeks ago uh -oh. when he uh, announced that uh, He's a militant, a supporter of Hezbollah, and announced that he expected to be martyred. And if mm. didn't hear from him again, that probably is what happened. So oh. he's a close friend of mine. Wow. Sorry, Jeff. What one analyst I heard said that they thought this would be a time with the BRICS that the Israelis would potentially, particularly increase the chances they would strike Iran because you know, to to rain on Putin's parade and, you know, all that, 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 that this heightens the risk of Israel at this point because of the BRICS meeting, um, you know, bombing Iran or going after Iran. I don't know what you think about that analysis. I just, I just don't know, except don't obviously know. the Israelis are acutely aware that we have an election in two weeks. Mm. There are things they can do between now and then that will destabilize the situation and perhaps help Donald Trump get elected, which is their fervent desire. Uh, um, whether Trump can do anything more in in supporting Israel or not is isn't clear to me. But uh, the Israelis prefer him on general principles that uh, um, he's a right winger who supports Zionism. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's that's the history of Zionism. Their best allies are always on the right and never on the mm -hmm. left. I want to go back to the situation in North Gaza. I see the independent media talking about this a lot, but I don't see the mainstream media or anyone in Washington talking about it in any serious way. How do you characterize that? And where are the openings to get this, get some attention for this in the mainstream? Yeah. So people are starving in the northern part of Gaza. Israel has uh, basically put it under a siege within a siege and has been uh, uh, holding up uh, food and water from entering, uh, fuel. And uh, Blinken said at his press conference that uh, they've taken some steps to improve the situation, but they need to do more. This is like the, the theme song of uh, the U.S. We wring our hands, we say bad, bad Netanyahu, bad Israel, and, and uh, you know, say if they if they don't do more something will happen and then a month later we say the same message if they don't do something better something will happen but the something never happens and uh and everybody knows that on all sides and so Blinken tried to get Netanyahu to publicly disavow this plan for depopulating northern Gaza and he refused to do that he, you know he's willing to say it privately to Blinken, but not to say it publicly as policy of his government. So almost nothing is going into northern Gaza and uh, people are desperate. And of course, they're being bombed even more intensely than before. And, uh, you know, people are leaving if they can. And uh, you've seen the uh, I'm sure you've seen on social media some of the pictures and videos. It's uh it's pretty startling. I mean, that, you know, the worst uh, images come from Israeli soldiers who are posting on social media. And uh, and this is really depraved. <laughs> you know. And I should have mentioned, of course, I think it was since our last meeting that Yahya Sinwar uh, was killed. Uh, 
and uh, you probably have seen that. I, uh, in case you're interested, I put the link to his will, which is worth reading. It's a sort of poetical document almost. Uh, and, you know, the Israelis are so delusional that they posted the video of his last moments, which, you know, have, have become iconic throughout the world now, you know, and uh, created him a bigger hero than uh, he ever was. And they thought somehow this would be humiliating. And it's exactly the opposite. So they are depraved and delusional. And, uh, and um, I don't know what more you can say. Uh, 